Hey, it's Dr. Setka again. This video, uh, which will be fairly brief, is designed to introduce you to this week's author, Edith Wharton, and to cover some of the primary themes that we encounter in this work, as well as to set you up for some comparisons of Wharton's work with a few of the others that we've read in this class. We're going to begin by watching a short biographical video uh, that talks a little bit about Wharton and her relationship to her setting, um, in particular, her domestic space. Even today, Edith, Edith Wharton, Wharton occupies, occupies a place as one of America's, America's leading literary, literary ladies. ladies. She was she born into the upper crust of old New York in the mid-1800s, a member, a member of high society, society who also exposed it through the prism of her pen. pen. Wharton wrote more than, more than 40, 40 books, books in 40, 40 years, years including, including Ethan, Ethan Frome and The Age of Innocence, Innocence for, which for which she became, became the first, first woman awarded, awarded the Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. For fiction. Today, Today, she is, she is also, also remembered, remembered for her home, home The Mount. The Mount. And, and if ever a house could serve as an autobiography, autobiography The Mount, the Mount is, it. is it. Situated, situated on a hill overlooking a lake in Lenox, Massachusetts, The Mount was conceived by the writer from the ground up. She dreamed its location guided its, its aesthetic, aesthetic principles, and designed and her elaborate, elaborate gardens. gardens. It, was, it was, in a sense, her own house of mirth, of mirth which, which she wrote while, while living here. here. This, this house, house was an opportunity for her to really do things the way she thought they ought to be done, and that was to really champion a return of classicism, symmetry, balance, proportion, uh, lots of light, and, and really opening up spaces, and to make them livable. We spoke with the Mount's Kelsey Mullen in Wharton's drawing room. The house's largest room when it was built in 1902, she used it to entertain frequent guests, like fellow writer Henry James. Well, they were very, very good friends, um, and she she, she matched, matched him in literary, literary skill, skill, I think, towards, towards the, the end. end. Wharton, Wharton designed, designed her home practically. practically. No, no space, space went unused. It was, it was large, large, but not grand. grand. And, it and it favored her predilection for, for privacy. privacy. Despite, Despite carefully crafted, crafted images of Wharton, of Wharton as a writer, as a writer staged, staged in her in library, library, she actually wrote, wrote elsewhere. elsewhere. Edith Wharton had always done her best work writing in bed. That was where the creative genius uh, inspired her. And so I think in building the mount, she created a, a space where she could have the privacy she needed to get her best work done. She did love her library, though, and a full two-thirds of her collection has been returned to the mount. What does her library tell us about her? It's been, it's been a, a remarkable, remarkable window, window into Edith, Edith Wharton's intellectual, intellectual life. life. She, she was, was reading across genres, 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 really a voracious, voracious learner, learner, and she was she reading in five, five different languages, languages sometimes, sometimes ancient, ancient Norse, Norse when she when she was feeling up for a challenge. She was reading books on astronomy and um, theology. Her books are riddled with marks, notations, and destruction. Dismayed with one publisher's choice to feature illustrations in one of her books, she found a remedy. In her own copy of The House of Mirth, uh, you, can you can see, see on the on title, the title page, page, she has, she has crossed, crossed out the name of the illustrator <laughs> in pencil, <laughs> and then and there, there are, all of the illustrations the have been razored out of the book. Amazingly, Amazingly Wharton, Wharton considered, considered herself a better, better landscape gardener than novelist, than novelist. Although, that's although that's slightly less astonishing when you, when you see her gardens, gardens which, which, fully recreated, recreated appear, appear as Wharton saw them. Saw them. She built the garden in stages as she was receiving advances from her books. Um, and, and it was during that time that she's taking these European ideas and placing them in an American context and fitting together a French garden with an Italian garden and a, an English lime walk all on the shores of the Massachusetts lake. All of this is a welcome second chapter to the Mount's history. Threatened with foreclosure just five years ago, the home has managed to climb out of its fiscal hole and is now running in the black. A footing regained, today the Mount is positioning itself as the Berkshire's literary hub, drawing the attention of writers the world over. Its champions also include former First Lady Laura Bush, who first fell in love with Ethan Frome as a West Texas schoolgirl. People read Wharton and realize that, in fact, while a lot has changed, a lot is still very much the same. And she just is so clean and muscular in the way that she sort of expresses it and observes it that um, her writing is as relevant today as it ever was. Meaning this is Edith Wharton's renewed Age of Resonance. So if you haven't already read Edith Wharton's short story afterward, now is a good time to pause and go back and read it because this uh, presentation does contain some spoilers. Um, but 
not having read it won't really help you understand the things I'm talking about. So make sure you read the story. Um, as I said, it's a short story by Edith Wharton. Um, Afterward was published um, in 1910 in an edition of the Century Magazine and was later reprinted um, in some of her short story collections. Um, it is a classic ghost story that centers on the themes of greed and retribution or revenge. Um, the ghost in the story comes for one of the main characters, Ned Boyne, um, to seek revenge for a, bu a business uh, transaction gone wrong. So the story uh, is about an American couple, Ned and Mary Boyne, um, who have struck it rich in America and have decided to move to England to try their hands at um, English aristocratic living. And so they buy a house called Ling. Um, the spelling of the house house's name, L-Y-N-G, uh, could also be phonetically pronounced lying, um, which is kind of an ironic uh, element of foreshadowing that kind of gets at the heart of what um, is wrong in the story and what precipitates the return of the ghost. Um, I'm showing you pictures here of Edith Wharton's own home, The Mount, um, because the descriptions in the story afterward of the house and its grounds really kind of remind me of Wharton's own home. What you see here is an image of a garden in the English style. So when you're reading descriptions um, in the short story of the hedges and the gardens, uh, you can imagine these images here. So the story itself is divided into five parts and is told as an exploration of the memories of the central character, Mary Boyne, um, with several instances of foreshadowing. The plot starts essentially at the end of the story and ba bounces back and forth throughout time within a six month period. Um, so it's a nonlinear story, which can make it a little difficult to follow at times. Um, so it's important to read really carefully. Um, there are a number of conflicts throughout the story, both internal, um, Mary's own struggles, um, within herself regarding her marriage, what's going on with her husband, etc., and external. Um, and these conflicts include the following woman against self, woman against another, woman against society, man against self, man against another, and man against society. Uh, again, the focus of the narration is on the central character, Mary Boyne. Um, she is really uh, content with the notion of separate spheres. She is happy not to know anything about her husband's business dealings. That is, until he goes missing. So her mood transforms from happy to worried and then sad. Um, and I would say even catastrophically devastated by the end of the story. Um, Mary's husband's uh, name is Ned. Um, he's a businessman who strikes it rich in the United States. Um, and after moving to England with his wife becomes really secretive. Um, and part of the drama of the story is Mary trying to figure out what secrets he's withholding from her. Uh, and in fact, these secrets, um, lead to his downfall. Now, although the action of the story takes place pretty much over the entirety of the estate of Ling, um, some of the most crucial moments in the story take place in the library. And you'll want to think back to our discussion at the beginning of our unit on the female Gothic of that image of the family sitting in what appears to be a library and the father um, kind of directing his son's attention to the world outside and the wife kind of focusingly, focusing inward on her younger children. Um, well, the library in Afterward functions in much the same way. It's where Ned does his, quote, work during the day. He's uh, supposedly working on a book. Um, it's where letters that eventually reveal the truth of Ned's secrets um, arrive. Um, and it's the place where Mary feels the least in control and the most in the dark, both literally in the dark and figuratively in the dark.